You, Mr. you oh. think, um, if I understand the position correctly, that Garmin does not cover the failure to take reasonable precautions to protect property, right? Yes, Mr. Chief Justice. Well, it seems to me that if it doesn't cover that, it surely cannot cover the intentional destruction of property. Does that seem reasonable? Uh, that certainly seems reasonable, but we have additional qualifiers on this reasonable precaution standard that illustrate the difference between it and Mr. Francisco's standard. The first is that our standard applies. Well, I, just to make sure you're, we're walking down the same road here, what I'm looking for is re reasons that intentional destruction of property uh, would not follow a fortiori from failure to take reasonable precautions to protect property. It depends on what destruction means, Mr. Chief Justice. If by destruction you mean the type of imminent harm that we're talking about, then yes, we agree that intentional destruction is a subset of our standard. But it's not clear that Mr. Francisco's standard is limited to that type of imminent harm. For example, let us say that grocery workers walk out of the grocery store and the food in the store spoils. I'm not certain whether Mr. Francisco would describe that as destruction of property or not. We well, but I mean the same ambiguity, it seems to me, would accompany reasonable caution to protect, to preserve property. I mean, if you're, a gro you're striking against a grocer, maybe sure, it's, it's sort of inevitable that, you know, the milk is going to go sour if you're not there. But in other words, that ambiguity doesn't seem to me to justify the distinction between those two categories. And it is precisely to deal with that problem that the board has added a few additional words beyond just reasonable precautions. It's reasonable precautions to protect property from foreseeable imminent harm caused by the sudden cessation of work. Uh, that, we think, has uh, allowed the board to say that there is a meaningful distinction between the spoilage of products that happens in the ordinary course and the type of harm that is alleged in this case. Well, but what you're saying is Garmin might not cover, may or may not cover, the fact that the milk is going to go sour or whatever it is, but we know that it doesn't, um, I always get these mixed up, but it does cover somebody who deliberately opens all the containers of milk and pours them down the drain. It just seems to me that intentional destruction of property is a much more serious concern than failure to take reasonable precautions, even if you want to add imminent and all that other stuff. But as I understand your position, you want to compel uh, uh, Mr. Francisco's client to squeeze its intentional destruction claim into failure to take reasonable precautions. I think we must distinguish, Mr. Chief Justice, between affirmative acts like pouring the milk down the drain and merely stopping work. Now, we accept there are some circumstances in which the union chooses an inopportune moment to stop work that is unreasonable under the circumstances. And that's what our reasonable precautions test is meant to address. But if you're concerned about pouring milk down the drain or affirmative acts like that, we have no objection to the notion that that is unprotected entirely apart from the reasonable precautions test that we have been advancing. Thank you. Well, it seems to me that the, the language of the statute doesn't go that far. It says that, that their claim is limited, as I understand it, to the recommendations themselves. In other words, this, this is the list of things that you might like. Um, but that information, the recommendation, is not provided under the words of the statute. It's not provided by another information content provider. It's provided by YouTube or, or Google. And so, although w whatever the liability issue may be, there's some issue tomorrow, we'll talk, there are a lot of others, the presence of an immunity under 230C, it seems to me, is just not directly applicable. Well, that's incorrect because of the word recommendation. There is no word called recommendation on YouTube's website. It is videos that are posted by third parties. That is solely information provided by another. You could say any posting is a recommendation. Anytime anyone publishes something, you could be said it's a recommendation. Well, they, well the, the, the videos just don't appear out of thin air. They appear pursuant to the algorithms uh, uh, that your clients have, and those algorithms must be targeted to something. And tar that targeting, I think, is fairly called a recommendation, and that is Google's. That's not uh, the, the, the uh, provider of the underlying information. 
So nothing in the statute or in the common law of defamation turns on the degree of tailoring or how you organized it. There's no distinct actionable message. If you say, I think my readers would all be interested in this, or I think the readers in zip code 2005 would be interested in it, or if you walk up to someone and say, I'm going to defame someone because I thought you might be interested in it. It's still publishing. And the other side gives you no line and no way to say in some way that would be workable or give websites or users any clarity of how you would organize the world's information. Just think about search. There are 3.5 billion searches per day. All of those are displays of other people's information, and you could call all of them a recommendation that are tailored to the user because all search engines take user information into account. They take the location, the language, and what have you. And I can give the example of football. Football, the same two users will enter the word football and get radically different results based on the user's past search history and their location and their language because most of the world thinks of football as soccer, not the way we do. And so if you go down this road of, did you target it? Then you have to say how much. Was the topic hitting too much? Was it okay to have a violence channel? Was it okay to have a sex channel? Was it okay to have, you know, what have you? Some other channel about skinny models that you could say, well, that just kept repeating the, the channel and that made me crazy. Well, but I mean, the, the, the difference is that the uh, Google, YouTube, YouTube uh, they're still not responsible for the content of the videos or, or text that is transmitted. Your focus is on the actual selection and recommendations. They're responsible that a particular item is there, but not for what the item, item says. And I, 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 don't, I, I think part of, it may be significant if the algorithm is the same across, as Justice Thomas was suggesting, across the different subject matters, because then they don't have a focused algorithm with respect to terrorist activities or, or PILAF or something. And then I think it might be harder for you to say that there's selection involved for which they can be held responsible. The, the, the statute, um, I think, doesn't draw the distinction that way. The, the claim here is about the encouragement of, of, of users to go look at particular content. And that's the JASTA claim that we'll hear about tomorrow. And the underlying substantive claim is encouraging people to go look at ISIS videos would be aiding and abating ISIS. More on that tomorrow. Um, but if that's an actionable claim, then the conduct here would fit within it. Um, the, uh, uh, because um, certain individuals would be shown these thumbnails which would encourage them to go look at those videos. Counsel, I'm, I'm sure I'm re misreading the graphs. Uh, on, I'm looking at 247, 248. Didn't half the borrowers say they would not have any trouble paying their loans without regard to the forgiveness program? So it varies based on income bracket. And yes, it's true that, that in certain income brackets, the data I think reflected that, you know, 51% of borrowers expected that they would be unable to pay their student loans. That wasn't the only, sec the only data the secretary consulted, though. In those same studies that he referenced, there was uh, general data about levels of financial insecurity. And overwhelming majorities of borrowers expressed huge financial insecurity concerns about their ability to make ends meet going 10 years into the future. Now, I think one of the important things to recognize, again, as I had mentioned in the last argument, is that it's not necessary for the secretary to make a finding that each and every borrower who really receives relief under this plan would have necessarily gone into default or delinquency without it. No, of course not. But I mean, it does kind of uh, factor into the consideration, particularly in a situation where you don't have notice and comment uh, proceedings. Uh, that maybe, uh, th again, that's something that a broader um, uh, representation of national interests in Congress would take into account rather than what the, uh, uh, the secretary in a particular case, who's weighing a lot of options and considerations as well, would take into account. I mean, if more than half the people say they don't need this relief, extending relief to that breadth uh, certainly raises questions.
So let me be clear that I think there is an avenue to address those kinds of questions with overbreadth. I, I don't think that it's a function of statutory interpretation, though. That would be applications of the statute to particular fact patterns and whether the secretary could justify the lines he drew and the level of relief he decided was necessary. And here, Secre Car Secretary Cardona explained that huge numbers of borrowers were going to go into default and delinquency, and it's not as though he could easily segregate and say, here are the 50 percent where I know for sure it will happen, and here are the 50 percent where it won't. If, if he could make that kind of determination, it might provide a basis to determine that he should have drawn different lines. But we don't have anything like that here. And I would just point again to the forbearance policy. You know, that has applied across the board to every single student loan borrower with a federally held loan for the past three years. Um, but I think that both secretaries acted entirely within the domain of the HEROES Act and recognizing that that kind of broad class-wide relief was necessary due to the particular exigencies of this emergency. Thank you. Um, since we're dealing uh, in, a, in a case with individual borrowers or would-be borrowers, I, I think it uh, appropriate to consider uh, some of the fairness arguments. Uh, you know, you have a, two situations, both two kids come out of high school, they can't afford college, one takes a loan, uh, and the other says, well, I'm going to, you know, try my hand at setting up a lawn care service, um, uh, and he takes out a bank loan uh, for that. Uh, at the end of four years, we know statistically that the uh, person with the college degree is going to do significantly financially better over the course of uh, life than the person without. Um, and then along comes the government and tells that person, uh, you don't have to pay your loan. Uh, nobody's telling the uh, person who is trying to set up the lawn service business that he doesn't have to pay his loan. He still does, uh, even though uh, his tax dollars are going to support the forgiveness of the loan. Uh, for the, uh, the college graduate who's now going to make a lot more than him uh, over the course of his lifetime. Now, it seems to me you may have views on fairness of that, and they don't count. I may have views on the fairness of that, and mine don't count. We would like to usually leave situations of that sort when you're talking about spending the government's money, which is the taxpayer's money, to uh, the people in charge of the money, which is Congress. Now. Why isn't that a factor that should enter into our consideration under the major questions doctrine again, where we look at things a little more strictly than we might otherwise when we're talking about statutory grants of authority to make sure that this is something that Congress would have contemplated? So my reaction to that, Mr. Chief Justice, is that Congress did take those kinds of considerations into account in specifically providing this authority to the secretary. I think that the same kinds of arguments well, about Well, it's just fairness, circular. You're, 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 it sort of you know, begs the question to say that, for, uh, first, I don't see any evidence that they took the, the, the person who's trying to start the lawn service because he can't afford college. I don't see any evidence that they took him into account. Um, but if that's what Congress would need to take into account and show, then it can't legislate. It can't provide the executive with pre-authorization to take action into an emergency. Congress can't look ahead to the future and say, okay, in the year 2020, when an unprecedented global pandemic hits, we've decided that the lawn care professional should you know not benefit from this program, but the student. So and yet you're relying should. on the on, you're relying on an interpretation of the statutory authority uh, to say that that's implementing Congress's intent to do that in a pandemic that they couldn't have foreseen. We do think no, they would have foreseen the idea when they said uh, uh, modify or waive that that would mean waiving the whole liability for 40 million Americans at a cost of half a trillion dollars, that they, foreseen, they foresaw that enough to allow the secretary to act without any express congressional authority any more express congressional authority than the authority you rely on? Well, let me break it apart into two different components, because I think there's a first order question of whether Congress could have foreseen the possibility of debt discharge at all. And I think the answer to that has to be yes. That was a well-established form of relief that you can provide to borrowers in, in hardship situations. As I previously mentioned, it's one of the core provisions in the Title IV. Uh, and Congress, in specifically enacting a statute that's aimed at this problem of not leaving borrowers worse off in reaction to a national emergency clearly understood that using so this broad language— So we're just going— that, uh, Well, so that's I'm the not, first not, question. Now, I recognize— I'm not, I'm not 
faulting yeah. you for repeating your answer since I think I probably repeated <laughs> my question. But you're just saying you know, it's the same argument about what modify and waive means. It is as a statutory matter on the categorical argument about debt discharge. Now, you have asked me several questions about the scope of this program, and, and let me try to be responsive to that. I recognize that this is a big program, but that's in direct reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic, which itself was a really big problem. There hasn't been a national emergency like this in the time that the HEROES Act has been on the books that's affected this many borrowers. And so I think it's not surprising to see in response to this once in a century pandemic, the kind of relief that the secretaries have offered here, the forbearance policy that has itself cost $150 billion and now this loan forgiveness program. To the extent that you have concerns about the scope and size of the program though, I would say that if I can get you to agree with me, and maybe I can't, on this point that the categorical debt discharge argument doesn't work as a statutory matter, then I think the right place to look to house those concerns is an arbitrary and capricious review. We think here that the Secretary drew reasonable lines in crafting the scope of relief, but if you disagree or if you think he should have taken different interests into account, that would be a basis to reverse him on arbitrary and capricious grounds, not to distort the plain meaning of the HEROES Act. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, General. I just have... Um, uh, question on the on the major questions doctrine, and I wanted just a little bit background for why I want to get your views on how it applies. You're you're arguing here that um, no notice and comment proceeding was required before the action taken on the half trillion dollars of loans, uh, and that because of your view that the president can act unilaterally, that there was no role for Congress to play in this either. And at least in this case, given your view of standing, there's no role for us to play in this, in this either. Now, we take very seriously the idea of uh, separation of powers and that power should be divided uh, to prevent its uh, uh, abuse. And there are many procedural niceties uh, that have to be followed for the same purpose. Um, the case reminds me of the one we had a few years ago under a different administration where the administration tried acting on its own to cancel the DREAMers program. Uh, and we blocked that effort. And I just wonder, given the posture of the case and given our historic concern about uh, the separation of powers, you would recognize at least that this is a case that presents extraordinarily serious, important issues about the role of Congress and about the role that we should exercise in scrutinizing that? significant enough that the major questions doctrine ought to be considered implicated? Well, Mr. Chief Justice, let me try to respond to the concerns about both the role for the judiciary and the role for Congress here. Um, we are not suggesting that there's no role for the judiciary to play. It's that these plaintiffs are not proper plaintiffs in this case. Of course, the court is bound by Article 3, and as I acknowledge to Justice Alito, we think that loan servicers, for example, would have standing to challenge this plan. But the fact that the, the loan servicers haven't yet challenged to date doesn't provide a basis to overlook those fundamental Article 3 requirements and distort the meaning of how this court has previously articulated standing principles uh, in a circumstance where the states can't otherwise demonstrate their standing to sue. With respect to the role for Congress, I think what's clear is, of course, we're recognizing that Congress could take additional action if it disapproves this plan. In fact, there were bills introduced to alter the text of the HEROES Act to specifically provide that the secretary can't authorize loan discharge. Those bills didn't pass, but that's one role Congress can play. I think, though, that if the court is focused on trying to ensure that Congress's role in this process is respected, that just argues in favor of reading this text in line with what the plain language suggests. You know, these are not words of limitation in the actual assertion of authority here, waive or modify any Title IV provision. The states want this court to say Congress really only meant waive or modify some of the provisions, not all of them, not the central provisions that govern repayment and cancellation, when those would have been obvious candidates for waiver or modification in a loan discharge program. And if the court overrides that clear HEROES Act language here, I think that it could only thwart Congress's intent in this particular posture of ensuring that you have the tools, the secretary has the tools he needs to take care of Americans in a, a national emergency situation. Well, whether Congress uh, acted or not was a factor that we considered in the major questions doctrine. And uh, the way we considered it uh, is whether or not the issue uh, that was before the court is something that had been seriously considered and debated and was a matter of political controversy before Congress. Um, that certainly is the case here, right? 
That's right. We're not disputing that this is a politically significant action. But if you're well, focused— Well, not just a politically significant action, but one that has the attention of Congress. The fact that it hasn't acted under the major questions doctrine but has considered the matter, uh, we cited as support for the notion that maybe it should be one for Congress. If you're talking about this in the abstract, I think most casual observers would say if you're going to give up that much amount of money, if you're going to affect the obligations of that many Americans on a subject that's of great controversy, they would think that's something for Congress to act on. And if they haven't acted on it, then maybe that's a good lesson to say for the uh, p uh, president or, or the um, uh, administrative bureaucracy that maybe that's not something they should undertake on their own. Well, let me react to that in a couple of different ways, Mr. Chief Justice. First is to emphasize that the unenacted legislation that the states are pointing to here um, did not mirror the particulars of this plan. So I don't think it would be right to say that Congress has specifically focused on this plan and disapproved it. And if the court were to go down that road, I'd point again to the fact that there's, there's legislative inaction on the other side of not amending the HEROES Act. But I would think that the court, as it usually does, would place more focus on enacted legislation. And here, during the pandemic, Congress enacted a provision of the American Rescue Plan that specifically anticipated and sought to facilitate a program of loan discharge by providing that it wouldn't be subject to federal taxation from 2021 to 2025. So I think that that congressional action actually carries more weight in the analysis. We had a few years ago uh, by Justice Scalia, he talked about what the word modify means. And uh, it's, he said modified, in our view, connotes moderate change. He said it might be good English to say that the French Revolution modified the status of the French nobility, but only because there's a figure of speech called understatement and a literary device known as sarcasm. We're talking about half a trillion dollars uh, and 43 million Americans. How does that fit under the normal understanding of modifying? So, of course, I recognize that in MCI, Justice Scalia's opinion adopted a narrower understanding of that term, but I don't read that opinion to set forth a universal meaning of modify, no matter the statutory context. And here, of course, we have a broader phrase, waive or modify. It's undisputed, and the states aren't contesting, that the ordinary meaning of waive means to eliminate an obligation in its entirety. And I think if you look at that phrase in the context of the statute, that means that modify has to mean making a change up to the point of of wholesale elimination. It would be really strange for Congress to say you can eliminate obligations altogether or tweak them just the littlest bit, but you can't do anything in between. Well, but it's waive particular reg regulatory or statutory provisions. That's that, right. That to me suggests a much more focused use of the word. Well, it's waive or modify paired with the authority to do that with respect to any Title IV provision. So I think that that, that is the. It doesn't say waive, modify or waive loan balances. That's true, but it's very clear that under the Title IV provisions that are expressly referenced in the statute, things like repayment obligations, cancellation, discharge are core features of the program and obvious candidates for waiver in a statute, the central purpose of which is to provide debt relief to borrowers. You know, Congress itself has provided for loan discharge and other circumstances in response to borrower hardship. It's included provisions in the Higher Education Act for bankruptcy, for example, or for total disability um, or school closure, other kinds of hardships. And so it couldn't have surprised Congress one bit that in response to hardship posed by a national emergency, the secretary might consider similarly providing discharge if that's what it takes to make sure borrowers don't default. You think because there's a provision to allow a waiver when your school closes, that because of that Congress shouldn't have been surprised when half a trillion dollars is wiped off the books? Well, I think it demonstrates that in a statute that's centrally focused on providing financial relief, that that terminology should be given its plain meaning, and Congress could have anticipated that in a particular situation, you might expect that the way that you need to ameliorate the borrower harm is through loan forgiveness. And Mr. Chief Justice, maybe I can just use an example drawn from the initial context of promulgation of this statutory relief. It was initially a bill that was limited just to helping service members who were fighting in wars. And think about an example of a service member who goes off to war, and you can provide HEROES Act relief to ensure that 
that the service member doesn't have to pay down the loan while the term of service, but if something were to happen that left that service member worse off because of his service, say a, a disability that doesn't qualify for total discharge, it makes perfect sense to think that Congress would have expected that the secretary would have authority under this act to make the service member whole and to ensure, just as the plain language suggests, that that service member isn't going to be left worse off because of the circumstance that prompted his service in the first place. And so there's that first order question of whether you can ever do any debt discharge. And I think in that context, it's perfectly sensible to read this language to authorize that. I understand your um, argument on standing, and I, I know this isn't directly on point, but when I saw it, it's sort of like the uh, equal protection cases, you know, where discrimination between men and women on the, the level of pensions and uh, the, the, the women, uh, the widows get more and the widowers get less and uh, the, the challenge is brought. And the argument was, well, if you win, we're going to take the excess away from the, the widows. So you're not going to get anything. So you don't have standing. Um, why is that case? I, I appreciate the way in which it's different, but why isn't that at least some authority on which they can rely? I think that the equal protection cases are fundamentally different because there, your injury is your complaint of unequal treatment. And so whether you level up or level down, your injury is being redressed. You're no longer being subject to unequal treatment and instead everyone is being subject to the same treatment. But this case stands in a very different posture because here their argument is our injury is we're not getting loan forgiveness. And the, the relief they're seeking, which is a declaration that the HEROES Act doesn't authorize loan forgiveness in the first place, doesn't address that injury one bit. It right, just carves it's, it's, it into stone. Right, but I mean, it, without looking after the case, yes, you could lower it or, or raise it, but that's an uncertainty that had, did, we, did not, we decided that that did not affect their right to bring the action because it may be changed in a particular way. And I suppose their argument would be that, you know, they are injured by not being uh, participating uh, in the program. And if the program is struck down in its current form, it may be changed in a particular way that would help them. So I think that there is, though, a, a complete disconnect between the claim of injury. And it's true that in the equal protection context, you don't know ex ante what the remedy is going to be. But the court has determined that doesn't affect standing because either way, no matter what remedy occurs based on the equal protection injury, it's going to fix the nature of the harm of providing unequal treatment. And here, the, the only certainty is that if they prevail on their claims, it's going to make it harder to provide them or anyone else with debt relief. Their suggestion here that the secretary wholly lacks this authority under the Heroes Act and their assertion of arguments to support that claim that broadly attack this whole concept of loan forgiveness, I think demonstrate that we're far afield from the equal protection case law. Can, I uh, can a judge dismiss um, a prosecution uh, because of erroneous uh, venue in his discretion, presumably? I mean, it depends at which stage. The, uh, judge, uh, if, if you move to dismiss the indictment because it's insufficiently alleged, then the judge can do that, and that wouldn't have preclusive effects. If it's off to the close of the government's evidence and it's a Rule 29 motion for judgment of acquittal, then that would, you know, that's the sort of, that, as this court said in Evans, is basically the same thing as a jury acquittal, and so that would have preclusive effects. And can he do that dismissal with prejudice or without prejudice, depending upon the particular circumstances? I, I don't think he could do it without, if, if he's making a sufficiency of the evidence determination on a Rule 29, as in he said, the government's evidence is closed, the I just don't think the government has provided sufficient evidence to support venue here. Then what, he what about have. what about before that? Bef as in uh, mid-trial, I think mid. I don't know if there's a or at the <laughs> or at the indictment stage. Oh, oh yeah, at the indictment stage, the government could say the indictment isn't sufficient. The the, the um, defendant could say, as we tried to say, it's not sufficiently alleged. The government can withdraw and try and go to a different venue. The judge can dismiss the indictment. He can go to a different venue. I think it might have. Well, can he dismiss it with prejudice? He can. He can dismiss it with prejudice probably as to refiling in the same venue under issue preclusion principles. I don't think he could dismiss the indictment with prejudice as to any other prosecution in another venue. But that's, that's you know, there are basically two kinds of dismissals. There's the indictment stage and there's the sufficiency stage. And the government's cases try to blur that line. But th this court has always said that distinction has fundamental consequences because one is a sufficiency determination and all agree this was a sufficiency determination. And the other is a question of, you know, the indictment and whether it's sufficiently alleged and the government does get another chance in that. But counsel, uh, what do you do about the government's argument that you're the one who is undermining First Amendment values because the whole point of the trademark, of course, is to prevent other people from doing the same thing. So if you win, 
you know, the slogan, Trump too small or whatever, it's, other people can't use it, right? Other people can't use it as a source identifier of their own, which I think is perfectly hard. Well, they can't use it the way you want to use it, and you say the way you want to use it is to engage in expression. Um, and so, and then in trademark, there are things that are kind of close to it that are also prohibited, right? So we'll have all sorts of litigation. I presumably be, there'll be a race for people to trademark, you know, Trump to this, Trump to that, whatever. Um, and then, particularly in an area of political expression, that really cuts off um, a lot of expression you might, other people might regard as important infringement on their First Amendment rights. Yeah, so a couple of points on that, Mr. Chief Justice. I, I take the concern, and I think it's, it's a, a fair one. I think a lot of that concern is, is dealt with by the requirement that a mark actually function as a mark. That means it's got to bring to mind, you know, in the mind of the consuming public, that it, you know, that is functions as a source identifier. It's you're not just expressing a common message. It's why God bless the United States or I heart DC. Those kinds of marks don't generally get registered. And I think that if in the main, many political slogans do not get registered for that very reason. And I think it addresses a lot of those concerns. So what we have to imagine is a mark that functions as a mark, and so it's kind of distinct enough and unique enough to kind of serve that purpose and satisfies well, all the yours, other. Sorry to interrupt, but if yours meets those requirements, it's hard to see what the limitation would be on all sorts of other things, except to the fact that they think it's, you know, whatever they think is a parody or, or, or a joke, and you can certainly find most adjectives and attach them to your phrase, and, um, you know, all those would be protected and only a limited number of people would be able to make the, you know, particular uh, for com comical uh, expression but carrying First Amendment in, uh, weight that, that you want to uh, arrogate to yourself here. I think to some degree, Mr. Chief Justice, that is just built into the regime. And so I understood my friend uh, in his responses to your question, Justice Barrett, to, to eff effectively concede that the reason why if the PTO were to register this mark had form the former president sought registration of it. The reason why that wouldn't give rise to First Amendment concerns is because of what this court said in Jack Daniels, which is that the First Amendment and trademark law, when it sticks to its historical function, they play well together. Now, that I understand the, the concern about there being some chilling effect that might exist because, you know, someone doesn't want to pick a mark if they're concerned about being subjected to, to infringement litigation. And to some degree, that risk exists even without registration, but I, I understand that, you know, when a mark is registered, it, it, it gives the mark holder added benefits. I think if that is a concern that Congress wanted to identify, which we're a world from that here with this provision, which it was clear from the record that Congress was trying to make it so that no one used these marks, not that so anyone could use it as a source identifier. But if that, if Congress did identify that as a problem, I think it could try to achieve that narrow purpose and through a more narrowly drawn uh, a statute, but that's just not the statute that we have here. I'm, and I, I'm sorry, more narrowly drawn like what? Well, I think if the concern is ensuring that political speech or, you know, political speech that might not give really scream source identifier anyway, uh, it, that that, we don't want to register those kinds of marks because there could be some chilling effect. That could be a justification once you're in heightened scrutiny for a particular uh, prohibition, and maybe it would, you know, uh, survive, maybe it wouldn't. I'd have to see the justification. I think that's the beauty of intermediate scrutiny. You don't just assume an exception is constitutional. You see what the government says, and then you see if it uh, stands up. Is um, someone who drives 30 miles an hour in a 25 mile, mile an hour zone, does that person qualify as law abiding or, or not? I think that that wouldn't qualify to the extent that it's classified as a misdemeanor or minor criminal conduct under state law. And I do want to be clear that we, we certainly think that wouldn't apply under the not responsible category. But if you're focusing on law abiding in particular, we think that history and tradition there support the conclusion that you can disarm those who have committed serious crimes. So it's not just that any kind of, of conduct that is an offense would qualify. Is it, are you making a misdemeanor felony distinction? That's the line that history and tradition reflect. And so, yes, I think that that is the relevant category with respect to law-abiding citizens. But again, I would just emphasize here, we're not directly invoking the law-abiding aspect of the principle because Mr. Rahimi didn't have the kind of, of, of criminal record that would justify disarmament on that basis. Instead, our arguments here are directed at the aspect of the standard focused on those who are not responsible. Responsibility so, is a very broad concept. I mean, uh, 
not taking your recycling to the curb on Thursdays. I mean, if you're — if it's a serious problem, you're, it's irresponsible. It's setting a bad example, you know, uh, by — yelling at a basketball game uh, in a particular way. Uh, it, it seems to me that the problem with responsibility is that it's extremely broad. And what, what seems responsible to some — irresponsible to some people might seem like, well, that's not a big deal uh, uh, to others. So what is the model? I mean, is, is — do you go back to what was irresponsible at the common law or what's — take a poll and see if people think it's irresponsible, you know, to get into a — this fight at a at a you know sports event where tempers were running high or or what? So I want to be really clear that we're not using the term not responsible to describe colloquially anyone who you might describe as, as demonstrating irresponsibility in many of those contexts that you just described in your hypotheticals. Instead, we read this court's case law, and in particular, its articulation of that principle, we're tracking the court's language here, the principle of responsibility as being intrinsically tied to the danger you would present if you have access to firearms. And I would draw a parallel here to the principles the court has articulated with respect to sensitive sensitive places or with dangerous and unusual weapons in each of well, these categories. Just to be categories. clear, you're, you're using responsible as a placeholder for dangerous with respect to the use of firearms? Correct. So that's how we understand history and tradition in this context. And the reason that we've used the term not responsible is it, it's because it's the, own, the standard that this court itself has articulated in Heller and repeated in McDonald and then re repeated again in Bruin. I think probably the reason the court has used the term not responsible is it gets at the idea that some of the categories of people who can be disarmed might not intend to be dangerous. They might not be culpable in that sense, like the mentally ill or minors. And so I think responsibility gets at the idea that they might not actually intend to be a danger, but in fact would present the danger if so they have firearms. No, 